Thank you very much for the, the pleasure of joining the group and what a fantastic group you have together. It's, it's truly very impressive. So um, thank you for asking me to talk about enhanced recovery uh, and ways we can incorporate it uh, into our perioperative care because as you mentioned, it's really a, a, a crucially important opportunity for us. So just like the missions of the clinic, which are providing better care of the sick, investigating their problems and educating those who serve, I think venues like this, and particularly a topic like this, can really help us change uh, the benchmark and the way we look after our patients and their outcomes, and really drive us towards the concept of high reliability medicine. Because I think as we all realize, there's a lot of variability uh, in how many people manage their patients, still managing them the, the way they trained, uh, often many years ago. And so there's a clear uh, opportunity for us to learn from industry to reduce variability. So enhanced recovery pathways or enhanced recovery after surgery as it's now called started 17 years ago and uh, the names have changed over time but really I would argue that they're not new anymore they really should be standard of care and as we'll discuss the evidence behind them has clearly shown that they reduce hospital stay, they improve the efficiency with which we use our resources and they reduce the perioperative medical events that can happen to patients. And so really they epitomize evidence-based, high reliability medicine, and they help us provide the optimal value in healthcare. So this is another reason we need to look at things like this. This is a graph showing how much of an outlier, certainly for us in the US, uh, that we are compared to other developed countries and the US is that brown line that's significantly ahead of all the other developed countries uh, and unless we can use opportunities like this and medication control and equipment control in the operating room to control cost uh, we will just never be able to afford to look after our patients and so this is now driven into a major change for industry uh, the healthcare industry specifically where we now get paid instead of get pay, getting paid per case and by the volume of cases we do, we're increasingly getting paid for the quality of the service that we provide and the population that we look after. In fact, much like public care in many European and other countries. And so if there wasn't enough reason to do this just for patient care, the fact that we have to make our, our hospitals sustainable and viable financially means that we really have to pursue this equation of providing the best value for the lowest cost. This is a graph from a paper we published many years ago which just outlines the variability in cost depending on how a patient does. So let's not talk about technology in the OR, that's a whole different thing, but your day in the operating room is the most expensive day. But how you do, and apart from considering the complications for the patient, how you do after that uh, translates into a very different cost profile. The red bars are translating into a patient who has an ileus or a major complication. And you can see how expenses increase with imaging and would increase much more if they went back to the operating room or ICU. The orange bar, uh, this is from a paper we did on ileus, just so somebody who has a temporary uh, few days of ileus maybe gets a nasogastric tube and some imaging and then gets better a few days later. But really for both our patients and for the value we provide, we need to try and drive patients towards being that yellow bar. And we can do it through cost around the time of the procedure, optimizing our hospital stay, reducing variability and minimizing complications. So what causes this variability? Well, there's a few different things that cause variability. Some of them we've no control over, our practice profile. I guess you build up a practice profile over years, but it's hard to change the kind of cases that you get referred. Patient factors, if somebody comes in as an emergency with a BMI of 50, you can't do much about it and national culture. Length of stay in Japan used to be 18 to 20 days and if you told a patient they were going home the day after surgery, it obviously wouldn't fly. There are some things we have more control over, the operating facility we work at, the teams we work at, but really as surgeons we've got most control over the perioperative care plan we use and the quality of our surgical technique. And so this actually led Henrik Kalet, and this is a paper from his group in 2000, uh, to be one of the first to publish on this and certainly he was the first to really get uh, 
uh, traction in the literature when he published this fairly inflammatory title of a 48-hour stay after open colon resection. And Henrik looked at 60 patients undergoing colon resection, not pelvic surgery. He had a pretty complicated multimodal pathway at the time, but he published a really <coughs> impressive length of stay of two days as a median. Now, if you look at his bar graph, it was 4.1 days, but I think the most important point of this paper is just reminding us all, and particularly back then. So I'll take a pause now, Phil, and just maybe give you a point for discussion, but uh, just wondering whether people are using enhanced recovery pathways, as it's around now for almost 20 years. Uh, yes, John, that's a fantastic uh, opening uh, for this discussion, and yeah, let's find out what people are doing, uh, you know, across, um, you know, across the country and across the, the, the globe. Uh, let's go to our own folks in Cleveland Clinic Weston, and let's hear from Steve Wexner, Ronald Rosenthal, and Sam Sonstein about what they're doing. Um, let's go to Cleveland Clinic Weston. Steve, are you there? Yeah, yeah, can you hear me, Phil? Yeah, perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, excellent presentation, Connor, and um, I, I must say that, yes, we do try and follow the enhanced recovery pathways, in part because when Connor was part of the uh, colorectal department for his, uh, his first tour of duty, shall we say, he did a lot of this work and we were uh, very taken by how much better we could give our patients outcomes, how much we could improve their outcomes, and uh, it was less about reducing cost at that particular point in time because of the DRG system. It was more about improving outcomes, uh, the things like patient satisfaction, which again weren't even being measured in, a, in as objective a way as they are now. Uh, and, and also morbidity, you know, post-operative morbidity from being in the hospital, hospital-acquired infections and the like. So we do uh, follow it as much as we can. There are some things we can't do. For example, the, and he hasn't gotten to these details yet, but, but for example, the intravenous acetaminophen, which isn't available because of the cost prohibitive nature of what the uh, manufacturer unfortunately did with it. But many things, uh, many of the rest of the elements are there. And th there are some we don't practice. And I mean, I don't want to steal Connor's thunder from which are the elements of the program that people do and which are the elements they, they don't, uh, that carbohydrate loading. So some things we don't necessarily subscribe to. Fortunately, we have two fantastic local champions, Dave Marin and Fabio Patenti, both of whom have really work to ensure uh, common pathways, standardization of, of practice as, as much as uh, possible in, in terms of the um, enhanced recovery pathways. And so the, the short answer to that long diatribe is, is yes, we do believe very much in enhanced recovery and, and try to adhere to it. That's great, Steve. And it certainly does seem, or it is true, that colorectal surgery really has sort of led the way, and now we're seeing other areas, um, for example, my area of bariatrics, really begin to, to take off a bit. Well, let's hear from our other colleagues um, at Anne Arundel um, in Maryland. Can we go to Anne Arundel? Um, and hopefully, uh, Adrian Park and his crew are present for a comment. Are you there, Adrian? Yeah, Phil, thanks uh, for the question, and, and Connor, appreciate uh, uh, your, your, your thoughtful um, uh, presentation. Um, so I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. Courtney Doyle in a second. She's one of the champions of our, our colorectal efforts. But um, uh, lean uh, processes and, and, and uh, reducing variability is a real priority um, across our clinical, our surgical programs here. So one of the one of the areas that we've actually made a lot of inroads into um, is in our orthopedic program. So our, our joint program started out, uh, well, it didn't start out, but it's, it's the largest in the state. But um, uh, two years ago, our 23-hour our, uh, discharge rate was in the, in the teens percentage. And, and, uh, and this year, it's going to be close to 70% um, that are that essentially 23-hour. And this is all through ERAS processes. But um, uh, Dr. Doyle, why don't you tell us a little bit about our oh, there you are over there, about our um, our ERAS efforts in colorectal? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Park. Thanks, Dr. Delaney. I'm looking forward to hear the rest of your talk. Um, yeah, so we just started uh, implementing here at Anne Arundel, and we did the same thing. We started in colorectal to get our feet wet, and ultimately see. Um, how things are working, and we already had a short 
say um, prior to implementing our ERAS protocols, and we already decreased it um, by you know one to two days easily. So we've seen just in our limited um, experience with it that it certainly has positive impact. So we're starting to branch it into other areas. Um, bariatrics is next on my list, and. Uh, certainly our abdominal wall reconstruction and hernia programs. So um, we're, we're early in the stages, but we, we've already seen valid data from it and are um, looking, for, excuse me, looking forward to continuing it. Great comment. Do you have any uh, uh, more comments in response to our colleagues, uh, either uh, Weston or Anna Rundle? No, I think it's uh, it, it fits in with what's happening. I think the pendulum is swinging, and I think increasingly people are realizing that there's real clinical opportunity with this. Well, great, Carter. You want to tell us more um, specifically about uh, how this can affect our patients in the real world? Sure. A couple of sections. Talk a little bit about um, what we've done, and then maybe talk a little bit about opportunities for the future. So this is when we started doing it. Actually, Henrik came here to give grand rounds in February of 2000, around the time that paper came out. So uh, we started doing it back in 2000. And this is the first paper we published uh, with Dr. Fazio, Tony Senegor, a number of others. Um, and we looked at what, at that stage, we called a fast track pathway and um, looked at the post-operative outcomes. Now, we looked at quite a different patient population from Henrik's population. As you remember, they were open colon resections. So these were a lot of people having a reoperative surgery. Uh, you can see that picture in the uh, upper right, a patient with Crohn's who obviously had a number of uh, intra-abdominal septic complications and was referred in for surgery. And it really kind of anything went. So more, of, more than half of these patients had pelvic surgery. More than half of them were in this group who'd had a previous significant laparotomy, um, meaning not a gallbladder or appendix or a hysterectomy. Um, and we got a very similar mean length of stay to Henrik at about 4.3 days uh, with decent readmission and complication rates. And so when we plugged that into a, a couple of months of data in the department, we found that the, the surgeons who were using the traditional care pathway for open patients, and this is just open so far, uh, had a length of stay of about 7.7 .7 days. Uh, and for those of us using fast-track care pathways for our matched open patients, we, we dropped the length of stay significantly. And obviously, you can see that's a significant number of beds. So if you have a hospital that's fairly full and you can free up 40% of your hospital beds, uh, that gives you other opportunity. So we realized that one of the drivers, really, of, of enhancing recovery and of uh, looking at these outcomes is time to recovery from ileus. And so this is actually a, a placebo group from a pooled series of randomized controlled trials around the medication that was subsequently released as Entereg. And we defined a, an endpoint called GI2 recovery, which was tolerance of diet and passage of stool. And you can see that the median time to GI2 recovery was four days, and the mean hospital discharge was at five days. And it doesn't seem great now, but remember this is open. Uh, this was a long time ago, and this was across about 25 centers across the U.S., including a lot of community hospitals. Um, but as part of this, we were able to just define the baseline expectations. And so even within this group of fairly simple, open colon resections, there was a, almost a 12% hospital readmission rate. About 14% of patients stayed more than a week in hospital, which we defined as a prolonged hospital stay. And on the right, about 10% and had a post-operative ileus. So we started to do a number of trials around this. Uh, this is a randomized control trial where we randomized patients between this fast-track pathway and traditional. And you can see that whether it was uh, for patients under 70 or whether it was for surgeons with the most experience, we tended to knock about a day off length of stay. Now, at this stage, there was a bit of a Hawthorne effect. So the, the surgeons who hadn't been using these pathways were kind of using them, and their length of stay had come down a bit, and we, we powered for that in the trials. And then importantly, the patients were going home just as healthily. Their pain scores were the same, their satisfaction with stay was the same, and the readmission rates certainly were not increased. We looked at epidurals, perhaps a separate discussion or something we might talk about at one of the intervals. Um, but epidurals did not help us. And this is actually consistent with the Cochrane analysis and other things. Epidurals did not further reduce length of stay, which was five days in both groups. And this was now increasingly tending to be a reoperative open population. 
And then we started to use it on more complicated populations. So these were patients having an open proctocolectomy with ileoanal anastomosis, comparing about 100 using the CREED, as we call the pathway for a short while, versus traditional. And again, we knocked off a day of length of stay. Readmission rates didn't change. High in both groups, but this is the first paper ever to look at readmission rates in pouches. Uh, and we knocked about $1,000 off our direct cost. So we started to look at readmissions because it really became a, two things. One is it was a control for quality, and two is it was a discussion point by our colleagues who felt that these pathways really weren't safe for patients, that if you sent them home early, they'd have a higher chance of bouncing back into hospital. And so this was the first paper we looked at readmission rates, uh, which came out in 2004. And uh, we looked at about 550 consecutive resections and we phoned them all to make sure that they hadn't been readmitted to other facilities, and we had overall a 10% readmission rate. And we were able to show that there was more perioperative steroid utilization in the readmissions, but there were no other real predictors, not complications, not white cells, in fact, nothing else. So one of the important points from this paper was that when we looked at those readmitted patients, interestingly, they had a longer primary length of stay, meaning that if you went home early, you were less likely to be readmitted. And that's been a consistent finding now in, in many studies that we've published. And so we concluded that these readmissions were unpredictable. They did not appear to be related to the short length of stay, and they didn't adversely impact overall outcome. So I mentioned it was a control for quality as well. And so this is one of Henrik's follow-up papers, because he'd obviously been working in this space at the same time. And this is a three-year data set with 130 patients. Um, and you can see that in the right column at Hospital 2, his academic multimodal hospital, and their readmission rate bounced up to 20%. And that was one of the reasons for him to redefine his discharge date to day three instead of day two. And so if you're not careful, you certainly can have an increase in readmission rate. So it becomes a good control both for your care pathway and also for how your patients are doing. And that's something I'll come back to later on. We also dived into the readmissions, the causes of the readmission, to see if there were some preventable readmissions. Uh, and they break down into, as you would expect for an abdominal surgical population, uh, surgical site septic complications, ileus small bowel obstruction, that patient that comes back bloated or, or throwing up, <coughs> and medical complications, and a variety of others. And, and really, it's been challenging to reduce readmission rates a whole lot. Obviously, many, many protocols going on, and we've been able to move the needle a little bit. Um, but the, the causes are often so varied that it's hard to re reduce it. Um, but what is clear from meta-analyses and many papers now is that these enhanced recovery pathways don't cause the readmission rates to increase. So it's a really important control on the use of these pathways. So I don't know, Phil, I thought before I start talking about the components that, that we use, uh, maybe you want to ask one or two of the groups uh, if there's anything novel or, or anything uh, particularly important that they feel is uh, something that should be used for enhanced recovery. Yeah, Connor, that's a, that's a great, uh, great question. And uh, we have a you know, fantastic uh, both national and international audience. So I think many of us are curious as to what um, elements uh, are being incorporated into local protocols. So let's go first to um, our colleagues uh, in, in France, Strasbourg, France, uh, at IRCAD. And uh, if you could please identify yourself, I'm not able to actually see you, but if you could identify yourself, and we'd love to hear what's, what's happening at IRCAD. Hi, I feel it's uh, Bernard Allemagne, so uh, uh, a pity not, not being able to see you, but it's OK. <laughs> Um, so I'm, uh, I'm together with uh, some, some people from the hospital and uh, uh, Michaela Ignat is in charge of this uh, ERAS program in the institution, so she will comment a little bit about the question that you uh, address. So Michaela. Thank you. Uh, so for the components, uh, we choose not to use epidural. Uh, 
because um, our experience uh, when we started to uh, to work on ERAS is that we already have 70% uh, of the colectomy and colorectal uh, surgery done by laparoscopy, and the epidural wasn't uh, much help compared to uh, standard uh, analgesia. So from this point of view, we choose not to use it, so no patient will have it unless uh, there is a special um, indication for it. Otherwise, we use uh, most of the um, pathways, all the carbohydrates don't, um, except for the patient who has um, diabetes, in this patient will contraindicated. We also use for the analgesia the um, non-steroid anti-inflammatories, except for contraindication patient with uh, um, renal failure or so it's a case by case uh, contraindication if you want, but uh, for the rest we use all the all the components. So it was uh, in the beginning of the first year is a little bit difficult to see results from the errors, um, especially when we work a lot with uh, laparoscopy. So there is not too much of a change from the um, hospital stay. Um, but uh, I think we can see results uh, starting a little bit later, like uh, to, to the second year of the, uh, the employing of the pathways. It's uh, working a lot better because people are starting to change uh, habits and uh, not to have fear, actually. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it seems um, uh, from your comments that uh, your CAD um, and your group is uh, you know fully employed with U.S. concepts. Connor, do you have some comments about some of their um, their strategies? Are these consistent with what's happening elsewhere? Um, I think it's it's interesting. I think they're they're ahead of uh, a lot of Europe. There's a lot of European sites that are still using epidurals. Uh, but I was going to talk about some of the components that we use now. Um, so it's a good segue into the next section, Phil. Great. Please proceed. So um, there has been a lot of literature in this space now, and there's a lot of discussion about different components, but we've really tried to keep it as simple as possible. Um, so the evidence base is strong, um, and as uh, some of the comments went earlier, there's certainly the strongest uh, evidence and most volume around colorectal surgery, uh, where there's now a number of systematic reviews and meta-analysis and 16 randomized controlled trials. So we know that these pathways reduce length of stay, they reduce non-surgical complications, so they're not going to change your leak rate, but they'll change your likely congestive cardiac failure, pulmonary complication rates, and the readmission rates are, are equivalent. So what did we use? Uh, obviously, preoperatively medically optimizing the patient. Preoperative information is probably one of the single most important components. Uh, we assess frailty, uh, sometimes formally, sometimes less formally, uh, with their level of home support because it allows you try and determine what support the patient's going to need at the time of discharge. And that's something you need to plan before they even come into hospital because, because if they're going home on day one or day two, uh, you need to have that planning in place. Obviously, patients who are having a stoma need to be taught how to manage it, and particularly taught preoperatively, because they're not going to be around the hospital for too long postoperatively. Uh, and then we do use a bowel prep. Obviously, there's been a lot of discussion in Europe about not using bowel prep. Um, and I think to summarize that literature, bowel prep or no bowel prep is probably equivalent. But bowel prep plus oral antibiotics gives significantly lower infection rates and bowel prep without antibiotics. So the, the use of bowel prep with antibiotics is fairly consistent both here and increasingly nationally in the US. And then we give preoperative medications like Voltaren. Uh, the frailty score I mentioned, this actually we've studied it and it correlates directly with readmission rates. Uh, and this is the old information sheet we used. And the information's important because if somebody knows that a friend of theirs had surgery somewhere else and stayed eight days, but you're going to send them home in two days. They really need to be prepared to deal with that uh, postoperatively. And so we give them information about what to expect each day and then what to expect about specific components like postoperative pain, what they'll get to eat and drink, etc. Alvimapan, I won't dive into the data, but good randomized control trials, and this is uh, one of the meta-analyses we did looking at dose finding study for the FDA uh, and for open surgery. Uh, it certainly reduces length of stay, 
For laparoscopic surgery, it's not that clear. If you look at national database studies, it seems to reduce length of stay. If you look at specific institutional studies, this was one of ours and there are others, it doesn't seem to. And I think like some other things like goal-directed fluids, often the benefit that's noted is actually from the care pathway and in this case not necessarily from the alvimapan. So we don't use it for laparoscopic patients and we'll simply give a single dose to somebody at very high risk of conversion and then stop it if it's laparoscopic and most people don't get anything. Intraoperatively, just like Strasbourg, we avoid epidurals for open and laparoscopic cases, oral gastric tubes, minimally invasive surgery. We don't use goal-directed fluid therapy, although we try and restrict fluids in the operating room. And as I'll talk about later, we liberally use nerve blocks and we rarely use drains, almost never. The operative techniques, like at all of the centers online, is I know very uh, experienced groups and very well standardized, so I won't go into that. And postoperatively is probably the single most important thing. As Steve said, intravenous Tylenol is very expensive, so we don't use it. Patients get oral acetaminophen and a non-steroidal. Uh, they don't really get PCAs, and we minimize their opioids. And I think it changes their perception of pain because very few patients actually need them after surgery. Uh, they get liquids to drink as soon as PACU. Uh, they get oral analgesia the next day. They get food the next day. They get chewing gum because there's reasonable evidence and it's cheap and easy. They get to walk and sit out, which is important. It maintains their muscle mass and strength. Uh, we turn their IVs off usually the day after surgery and we've standardized their discharge criteria. And so this is old data, 16 years old. And you can see what happens then when you plug laparoscopy in with the pathway. That 39% reduction in length of stay becomes a 60% reduction in length of stay. Uh, and as long ago as uh, back then, there were patients that we could get to go home in an average of three days. So that has other implications. We talked a little bit about cost earlier on. And this is what happens when you combine laparoscopy, uh, done as cost efficiently as possible, with a care pathway versus open colectomy. Uh, with a less standardized care pathway. And you can see that it cuts about half the length of stay and bed utilization, and it drops the cost uh, more than 10%. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, when you dive into the cost, as you would expect, it still costs a little bit more in the operating room for operating room equipment. And this is even if it's just laparoscopy. This isn't thinking of robotics or other things. Uh, but you get a return investment. And the return on the investment is particularly for nursing costs, as you might expect. And that's two things. It's length of stay on the nursing floors, uh, and it's less use of the ICU. And this has been robust. These are two 1,000 series, 1,000 colon series uh, that we published. And the second row from the bottom, uh, you can see the mean hospital stay uh, up to 2005 is about 3.7 days with a 9% readmission rate. And the mean length of stay went up a little in the second series, largely because there's more patients with ostomies and more rectal cancers and totals. Uh, this is after the cost trial. Um, but the readmission rate stayed low. And really, for a large population of patients, uh, it's been a fairly robust outcome with uh, good outcomes and short lengths of stay. So much so that we noted that readmission rate and hospital stay actually are good quality markers. So this is a paper we published a number of years ago showing that uh, when you plug hospital stay, readmission, and mortality into an equation, knowing that if patients don't die and they don't get readmitted and they stayed a short time in hospital, they probably did pretty well. Well, this directly correlates with complication rates. And you can actually define a caterpillar graph of hospitals um, just like Nisquit. And we have a paper uh, being written at the moment showing how this harm score actually uh, pretty directly correlates with Nisquit but you can do it from three simple administrative endpoints instead of needing uh, a nursing team. So just a question then for maybe another center, Phil, you might want to ask uh, what kind of quality controls do we need if we're going to employ these, um, these kind of pathways? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Connor. And let's hear more from some of our international uh, sites that are on today. Uh, can we go to um, Sherzedek Medical Center in Israel and uh, please introduce yourself and let us know what you think about this question. 
Hello, everybody. We really enjoyed uh, the presentations and the uh, discussions. Um, we do uh, have a full implementation of ERAS in uh, colorectal and also other major surgery like HPB. Uh, about your specific question of uh, uh, quality control measurements, uh, we do uh, have a, uh, um, a registry with uh, full detailed um, factors that we check on the patients, including uh, um, calling them at home after they were discharged. Um, uh, we include uh, some of them, uh, some of the measurements that you have mentioned already, like uh, readmission rate, reoperation rate, uh, but also uh, uh, deep vein thrombosis, uh, surgical site infections, um, and also return to normal activity, uh, depending, of course, on the patient uh, and what uh, was his activity prior to the, uh, to the surgery. Um, and. Uh, as you uh, cited some of the uh, studies, it looks like uh, we can really uh, reduce uh, complications and uh, and uh, quality of and get a better quality of life with the implementation of the ERAS. So we are in there. <laughs> That's excellent, uh, Carl. Do you have any specific comments uh, for the folks uh, uh, in Israel? No, I think that's perfect. Uh, there are other endpoints we, we look at, and um, I'm not going to dive into them, but I think it's really important to look at all of the perioperative surgical outcomes as well, uh, such as surgical site infection uh, and other things. So uh, great and very timely and appropriate comments. Thank you. So maybe talk a little bit about the future. Um, you know, and can we achieve a 23 to 48 hour stay after colorectal resection? Uh, Adrian talked to us about their experience with orthopedics, moving from teens up to 70% uh, discharge at 23 hours. Um, and we certainly have programs around orthopedics, and it's, it's one of the great areas for opportunity of standardization. Um, but how can we do in a colorectal space? So we started looking at this uh, about 10 years ago, actually. Uh, and this is uh, 118 consecutive cases. And in the second column here, uh, you can see uh, the patients who went home within one or two days after a laparoscopic bowel resection. Um, and you can see they had significantly fewer complications than the patients who stayed four or more days in the right column. And you can see they also had a lower readmission rate uh, than the patients who stayed four or more days. So the overall readmission rate here was 8.5%, but those who went home in one or two days had a 5% readmission rate. Uh, reminding us of that slide I showed a little earlier on, that going home early uh, ends up being a marker for not being readmitted. And so we're trying to define the population of patients who can safely go home early uh, without having a problem at home and without being readmitted, and it looks like it's working. So we tried other things to tweak these pathways in the laparoscopic patients, uh, mirroring many of the um, open randomized control trials we did. This was one around epidural use in laparoscopy with a care pathway. Uh, and you can see that this did not help our length of stay. Older data, uh, but still we didn't change our length of stay more than a, a point of a day, so 2.3 versus 2.4 days. And so much like uh, open care, uh, we really haven't been using epidurals. And there's a couple of other things we tried, looking at uh, injection of local around wound sites and uh, other things and some medications, but this is probably the biggest game changer uh, that we've had. And these are a couple of studies we've published uh, in the space of TAP blocks or transversus abdominis plane blocks. Uh, and these studies were actually done looking at a, a combination of acetaminophen, high dose oral acetaminophen, and a TAP block uh, with a care pathway. So in this left column of ERP, the enhanced recovery pathway, uh, you can see that we had a population of patients who were arguably doing pretty well. They had a mean length of stay of three days after surgery, or a median of three. Four percent were going home on day one, not quite the teens of Adrian's <coughs> orthopedic patients. Uh, another 19 percent going home on day two. But when we changed our pathway, and it's really been the only truly major change uh, over the last 16, 17 years, to using a TAP block uh, and the high dose oral acetaminophen, you can see that the mean hospital stay dropped to about two days. Um, and now we have about a third of patients going home the day after surgery, uh, another third going home the second day after surgery. Uh, 
uh, and many of the others going home the third day after surgery. And we did a randomized control as one of these studies, which showed, that, and that was just looking at the tap block itself, uh, showed the significant improvement uh, in pain score. And so if I, I just think of this week, I did three cases on, uh, three abdominal cases on Tuesday, and two of them went home on Wednesday, and one of them went home yesterday on Thursday. So an average length of stay of 1.3 days for three cases. So, you know, it really becomes robust and saves you time rounding, but for the patient, it uh, actually gets them home healthy, earlier to their family in a, a nicer environment. And this has been very safe. Uh, this is a paper Debbie Keller did when she was working with us, uh, looking at almost 3,000 consecutive cases. And I'm not quite sure what happened with the formatting there, but the left column is those who went home in less than or equal to two days. And you can see that the 30-day readmission rate was 3%. So we're reproducibly defining a population of patients who can safely go home early and do well. So what about the future? Uh, this is a paper uh, that Tony Senegor and Brad Champagne and I uh, just published this month based on a, a study we did, a case. Uh, and this is an interesting cheek swab which gives you a genetic profile of the agents that patients can metabolize well. It's still a little expensive. It's about $400 uh, per patient. Um, but we're starting, hopefully in the near future, a randomized controlled trial looking at this. But this was like a, a phase one study. And so we did it on a series of patients and looked to see how much it would impact uh, a change in their opioid utilization and their OBAS scores. And we expected maybe you know, 20%, 25% of patients we might change their analgesics, but actually 50% of patients we changed their analgesics from our standard pathway. So that's you know, the patient who's not responding well and you give them more opioids because they're not responding well. So they get the side effects, but maybe they're the patients who aren't getting the clinical benefit or the patient who might be getting a side effect from a non steroidal And so this might allow us prospectively to determine uh, what, are, what are the right steps. And just a couple of data com coming back here uh, to the clinic and a number of people in the room who've really been hugely helpful uh, in trying to get the pa care pathways working here. And what you can see is towards the middle part of 2016, about halfway across that graph, is a significant drop in length of stay. Um, about a 20% overall reduction in length of stay for colorectal surgery. And we're trying to share that with other groups throughout the hospital, including urology and gynecology and others. Uh, and these are data from Akron General, which is uh, our 500-bed hospital to the south. Uh, and Mark Aravis there is the chair of surgery. And this is their experience uh, with using an enhanced recovery pathway, uh, the one we'd had at Case, for their colon patients. And you can see that their hospital stay dropped from 5.4 days to 2.3 days. But to Steve's point, it actually has significantly improved uh, their HCAP scores. And for those of you who aren't in the US, the HCAP scores are the patient satisfaction scores that we get measured on and increasingly reimbursed on. And so it's probably the fact that these patients are now getting a standard message from nursing, anesthesia, surgery about what the recovery should be and when they should go home. And so it's improving their satisfaction. And then from the hospital perspective, you uh, reduces costs. So in conclusion then, Phil, um, you know, as I said, I think these pathways are standard of care. I think they epitomize high reliability medicine. Uh, as surgeons, it gives us the opportunity to improve quality, to reduce our cost structure, improve our opportunity cost, getting more patients through those same hospital beds. And so it's interesting to think about what we might ultimately be able to achieve, if I could spell properly. Um, you know, if we can routinely get people home in, in 23, 24 hours after colon surgery. Um, because I, I think that'll just give us the opportunity to transform patient recovery and more reliably get them to chemotherapy <coughs> if they need it, more reliably get them back to productivity and a normal life and to their homes and their families. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity of uh, talking about enhanced recovery. Yeah, Carter, that's excellent. Um, You've given us a really strong evidence-based rationale for incorporating uh, these very impactful UF uh, protocols into daily practice. What I'd like to do in the remaining 10 minutes or so is hear from our other sites. I'm going to ask each site to tell us what single UF uh, element 
uh, whether it's tap block or preemptive analgesia or whatever, what single element um, has been impactful in your uh, program and tell us how it has benefited you. And I'll start uh, by saying that in bariatrics at Cleveland Clinic, I copied some of uh, Connor's tap block or laparoscopic tap block uh, protocol and we've been implementing that um, for the last six to nine months and have seen a very strong impact in post-operative pain and length of stay. So we're very impressed with that uh, modality. But I'd like to hear from our other sites and let's go back to our international sites uh, in the following order. Let's hear from uh, Dalhousie in Nova Scotia, then Imperial College of London, and then we'll get back to the United States beginning with Mount Sinai, New York. Let's go to uh, Nova Scotia, Dalhousie. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I don't think you guys yeah. are doing that. Yeah, we, uh, first of all, so I really enjoyed that presentation. I thought it was fantastic. Um, this is a great overview of ERAS. Um, what we're doing here is, there's, there's actually, we don't have standard protocols for our colorectal team. Uh, none of them are here to uh, justify their position, but we've uh, largely had uh, some challenges as far as uh, implementing standard, standardized care pathways. I would say no need with acid tubes and early feeding, and we certainly do high rates of laparoscopy, but again, it's, we haven't got the consensus within our own group here to uh, kind of adopt uh, standardized protocols. I wouldn't say we reflect the experience in, in Canada at all, though. There's a lot of trainees in the room that's from across the country, and there's a lot of variability, but very high adoption rates of uh, EOS across the country, Ontario, and, and uh, particularly, you know, the McGill group. But, uh, but you know, we're kind of dragging our feet a little bit, and uh, this is a kind of, you know, presentation that uh, you get a feedback to the to the chair and say, you know, what are we doing here? So, great, great talk. And Connor, what would you recommend to help these guys stop dragging their feet? What should they do first to get started? There you go. Well, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to share our pathways with you. And you can see Dave Liska there just with the tie and the white gold in the background. He's really been helpful and particularly instrumental in getting it up and going uh, for us here for colorectal again. And so looking at the literature, you know, there isn't a huge amount of evidence around any single component. There's increasingly evidence about some components that we can drop, uh, epidurals we talked about, carbohydrates, interestingly, although it's been talked about a lot in Europe, the evidence for them is uh, all physiological and not clinical, and there's actually a pretty good meta-analysis from about two years ago showing carbohydrates probably don't help. The single most important thing is having a pathway. Uh, informing the patients and having a pathway. And the basic components of the pathway are minimizing opioids, ambulating the patients, and feeding them early. Uh, and if you do those things, they're the they're key parts of, of getting them home well. Okay, Carl, that's great. Let's, um, let's go across the pond again to um, uh, Imperial College of London. Uh, good morning. Please identify yourself and tell us, um, you know, a single thing that you're doing that has made an impact on your patient regarding ERAF. Uh, good afternoon. Um, this is Jamie Murphy, one of the colorectal surgeons from London. Uh, Connor, thank you very much for what was an excellent talk. Um, we've obviously been using ERAS for quite a long time, probably up around about 15 years now in the UK, and it's actually mandated by the NHS. So it's, it's a slightly different situation. I think for us, probably the single thing that has changed over the past few years is the use of, as you suggest, tap blocks and regional blocks um, to minimize the pain and decrease the use of the opiates. We have also moved away from epidural as well. Some of us are still using quite high doses of single shot uh, spinal um, for the treatment of some of our laparoscopic procedures and some of our open ones. But I think, the it's, again, because it's a different healthcare system, we've got about an 80% uptake of laparoscopy for colorectal surgery. And ERAS has been quite well established for about seven of the past 10 years. But I think, yes, the tap blocks is very, very useful. Uh, Connor, any comments? No, oh, I, I mean, Jamie's hit the nail on the head. I think the UK did a great job in, in mandating it. Uh, I think the question when you mandate something is what, how you pick the components, uh, and that's evolving for them too. And so they've got a, a long experience with it, and a, a number of people have done some great work, like. Uh, Tim Rockall around spinals and things like that. So, um, great work, Jamie. 
But let's go to um, Mount Sinai uh, in New York, and here's some, some of our colleagues uh, stateside, uh, which, what you guys are doing that's been impactful. Uh, hi, Bill. It's Dan Heron here at Mount Sinai. Um, we're participating in the energy protocol for our bariatric patients, and I think uh, there's obviously some significant differences between the bariatric population and the colorectal population. In some patients, the postoperative pain is really the one thing which is keeping the patient from going home. Uh, and in, in our bariatric patients, particularly the sleep gastrectomies, it's generally tolerating a PO diet, uh, postoperative nausea and vomiting, which is the one thing with, which holds them up. So what we found has been very helpful is uh, probably two things. Number one, moving from the, the narcotic to the non-narcotic pain medications, and also speeding up the whole diet progression. Uh, so starting uh, what we call stage one diet, low calorie clear liquids, right in the PACU, uh, and, and that really seems to speed up the process of getting the patients home quickly. One issue that, that we're having, which we haven't really talked about, is you know anytime you institute a pathway like this, um, is getting compliance amongst all the surgeons. You know, a pathway is important, but we also like to recognize the autonomy of the individual surgeons. As an example, some of our surgeons feel that uh, Toradol uh, will increase their perioperative bleeding. Uh, others feel that it does not, and that it, it results in a in a very significant improvement in pain control and a, and a significant reduction. In uh, in postoperative pain and use of opiates. So I'm a big Toradol advocate, but some of my colleagues are not. And, and so we've had some uh, challenges in terms of getting getting buy-in from all the surgeons. And I wonder if, if you could address how you deal with that, uh, Connor. Yeah, that's a great point, Dan. Um, so I, I think at any center, there's going to be some ability to let people use it. So the way we've tried to address it always is by developing the pathways through consensus and bringing everyone together and giving everyone the opportunity to contribute to the pathway. Uh, and then once it's established by consensus, it becomes the electronic order set. So then a surgeon can opt out of using Toradol if they want, um, but most don't. It becomes easier to use the pathway. Um, again, the, probably the most important thing is just having that pathway. There's so little evidence for plus or minus Toradol or plus or minus acetaminophen or any other thing that I, I think that's fine. Uh, and that gives them the opportunity to be individuals. Uh, having said that, I think the evidence is clearly showing that using these pathways that are standardized and everyone shares them improves the outcome. So it's becoming more difficult for surgeons to be individuals, which is really what we all want. There should be one best evidence-based practice. Uh, we should be able to agree on it and we should be able to use it to make our patients better. But it is a challenge getting everyone on board, absolutely. Great, and uh, thanks, uh, Dan Heron, for your comments. And uh, happy to hear that bariatrics is stepping up uh, in the, the heels of colorectal surgeons and trying to implement a national program, actually led by our own Stacey Brethauer, who is the president of uh, ASMBF. We have um, one final question. Let's go to, back to Anne Arundel. Um, Anna Rundle has uh, a question. Uh, please go ahead. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Frank Quinn. I'm one of the uh, acute care surgery surgeons uh, here at Anna Rundle. Um, so I was wondering what uh, experience you might have had with uh, the use of ARAS uh, protocols in acute uh, surgery cases. You know, some of the things obviously you can't implement, like the uh, um, the valve preps and things in patients that have small valve obstructions or um, they're taking the surgery more acutely. Uh, have you had any experience or uh, seen any uh, benefits uh, or any protocols that we can implement with uh, more acute cases? Absolutely, that's a super question. Um, and so the way uh, I've always done it is that we just use the pathway. Uh, they get all the same opioid sparing, ambulation, pulmonary toilet, information but you may want to be a little slower introducing the diet. You know, obviously if they're obstructed with six centimeter dilated small bowel and they have a nasogastric tube in, we're not gonna feed them in recovery. Um, so, you know, just because you have the pathway doesn't mean you need to use every single step for every single patient. And I, I think like anything, you've got to nuance it. You know, if the patient is 90 in a wheelchair and 300 pounds, they're probably not gonna go home the next day either, whether they're tolerating diet or not. So. I think all of these pathways you've got to use appropriate medical decision making. 
but specifically around emergency cases, uh, I would just use all of the components for the early um, introduction of diet, and it, it seemed to work well for us. Okay, well, I, I believe our time's up. Um, Tom, do you have any uh, last very brief uh, closing remarks? No, I'd just like to thank you and thank everyone for joining. Uh, but thank you for the opportunity, Phil. Uh, really enjoyable hour. Well, again, excellent, Connor. Um, fantastic presentation. We've heard a lot of uh, uh, interesting feedback from across the globe at what people are and are not doing regarding ERAS. But one thing is quite clear that um, ERAS is definitely um, emerging as a standard and we all need to pay a lot of attention, uh, mostly uh, for the benefit of our patients and also reducing uh, costs um, and uh, stability related to recovery. So again, thank you all for joining us.